Aristotle Socrates Onassis, the 20th of January 1906, the 15th of March 1975, commonly called Ari or Aristo Onassis, was a Greek shipping magnate who amassed the world's largest privately owned shipping fleet and was one of the world's richest and most famous men. He was married to Athena Mary Levanos, had a long-standing affair with opera singer Maria Callas and was married to Jacqueline Kennedy, the widow of U.S. President John F. Kennedy. Onassis was born in Smyrna, and fled the city with his family to Greece in 1922 in the wake of the catastrophe of Smyrna. He moved to Argentina in 1923, and established himself as a tobacco trader and later a shipping owner during the Second World War. Moving to Monaco, Onassis fought Prince Rainier III for economic control of the country through his ownership of SBM, and its Monte Carlo casino. In the mid-1950s, he sought to secure an oil shipping arrangement with Saudi Arabia, and engaged in whaling expeditions. In the 1960s, Onassis attempted to establish a large investment contract, Project Omega, with the Greek military junta, and he sold Olympic Airways, which he had founded in 1957. Onassis was greatly affected by the death of his 24-year-old son, Alexander, in a plane crash in 1973, and he died two years later. Chapter 1, Early Life Chapter 1 Section 1, Anatolia Aristotle Socrates Onassis was born in 1906 in Keratas, a suburb of the port city of Smyrna in Anatolia to Socrates Onassis and Penelope Doliga. Onassis had one sister, Artemis, and two half-sisters, Calaroy and Merope, by his father's second marriage following Penelope's death. Onassis became a successful shipping entrepreneur and was able to send his children to prestigious schools. When Onassis graduated from the local evangelical Greek school at the age of 16, he spoke four languages, Greek, Turkish, Spanish and English. Smyrna was briefly administered by Greece in the aftermath of the Allied victory in World War I, but then Smyrna was retaken by Turkey during the Greco-Turkish War. The Anassis family's substantial property holdings were lost, causing them to become refugees fleeing to Greece after the Great Fire of Smyrna in 1922. During this period, Onassis lost three uncles, an aunt, and her husband Chrysostomos Konialidis and their daughter, who were burned to death in a church in Theotera where 500 Christians were seeking shelter from the Great Fire of Smyrna. Chapter 1 Section 2, Argentina At age 17 in 1923, Onassis arrived in Buenos Aires, Argentina, by Nansen Passport, and got his first job as a telephone operator with the British United River Plate Telephone Company, while following studies in commerce and port duty administration at Aduanas Argentinas. He later became an entrepreneur, creating an Argentine import-export company, going into business for himself and making a fortune importing English-Turkish tobacco to Argentina. He obtained Argentine citizenship in 1929. Eventually he established his first shipping trading company in Buenos Aires, Ostieros Onassis. After gaining his first fortune in Argentina, he expanded his shipping business worldwide and relocated to New York City, USA, where he built up his shipping businesses empire while keeping offices in Buenos Aires and Athens. His legacy in Buenos Aires was the creation of a shipping empire and a Hellenic culture fund providing youth scholarships and an academic international exchange program between Argentina, Greece, Monaco and the United States. The programs are funded and administered by the Onassis Foundation and were eventually under the managing direction of his daughter Christina Onassis. Chapter 2, Business Chapter 2 Section 1, Shipping Onassis built up a fleet of freighters and tankers that eventually exceeded 70 vessels. Most of the fleet operated under flags of convenience where laws and regulations are more lax than those of the owner's country. More austere regulations in countries such as the USA which afforded higher wages and safety standards allowed access to domestic routes with higher freight rates but at far greater running expense. As was then common practice in international shipping, Onassis fleet had mostly Panamanian and Liberian flags and sailed tax-free while operating at low cost. 
This and his astute business sense helped Onassis earn handsome profits in the highly competitive shipping market. Onassis made large profits when the big oil companies like Mobil, Socony, and Texaco signed long-term contracts known as time charters at fixed prices before the spot market fell. The high profitability of the Onassis fleet has been attributed in large part to his disregard for standards that normally govern international shipping. For example, after his Liberian registered tanker SS Arrow ran aground and spilled oil into Chedabucto Bay, Nova Scotia in 1970, still the most significant oil spill off Canada's east coast, there was a commission of inquiry. Led by Dr. Patrick McTaggart Cowan, Executive Director of the Science Council of Canada, the Commission found that the Arrow had been operating with almost none of its navigation equipment serviceable, radar had ceased to function an hour before the ship struck, the echo sounder had not been in working condition for two months, and the gyro compass had a permanent error of three degrees west. The officer on watch at the time of the accident, the ship's third officer, had no license and none of the crew had any navigational skill except the master, and there are even doubts about his ability. Chapter 2 Section 2, Monaco Onassis arrived in the Mediterranean Principality of Monaco in 1953 and began to purchase the shares of Monaco's Société des Bains de Mer de Monaco via the use of front companies in the tax haven of Panama, and took control of the organization in the summer of that year. Onassis moved his headquarters into the old sporting club on Monaco's Avenue de Stange shortly after taking control of the SBM. The SBM was a significant owner of property in Monaco, its assets included the Monte Carlo Casino, the Monaco Yacht Club, the Hotel de Paris and a third of the country's acreage. Onassis' takeover of the SBM was initially welcomed by Monaco's ruler, Prince Rainier III as the country required investment, but Onassis and Rainier's relationship had deteriorated by 1962 in the wake of the boycott of Monaco by the French president, Charles de Gaulle. Onassis and Rainier had differing visions for Monaco. Onassis wished the country to remain a resort for an exclusive clientele, but Rainier wished to build hotels and attract a greater number of tourists. Monaco had become less attractive as a tax haven in the wake of France's actions, and Rainier urged Onassis to invest in the construction of hotels. Onassis was reluctant to invest in hotels without a guarantee from Rainier that no other competing hotel development would be permitted, but promised to build two hotels and an apartment block. Unwilling to give Onassis his guarantee, Rainier used his veto to cancel the entire hotel project, and publicly attacked SBM for their bad faith on television, implicitly criticizing Onassis. Rainier and Onassis remained at odds over the direction of the company for several years, and in June 1966 Rainier approved a plan to create 600,000 new shares in SBM to be permanently held by the state, which reduced Onassis's stake from 52% to under a third. In the Supreme Court of Monaco the share creation was challenged by Onassis who claimed that it was unconstitutional, but the court found against him in March 1967. Following the ruling Onassis sold his holdings in SBM to the state of Monaco, and left the country. According to Frank Brady in Onassis, An Extravagant Life, Onassis' words about the issue were, We were gypped. Chapter 2 Section 3, Saudi Arabia During the oil boom of the 1950s Onassis was in final discussions with the King of Saudi Arabia for securing a tanker transport deal. Since the Arabian-American oil company had a monopoly on Saudi oil by a concession agreement, the U.S. government was alarmed by the tanker deal. By 1954, a specific U.S. policy for Saudi Arabia, in addition to strengthening the U.S. special position, was to take all appropriate measures to bring about the cancellation of an agreement between the Saudi government and Onassis to transport Saudi oil on his tankers and in any case, to make the agreement ineffective. The arrangement would have ended monopoly control of Saudi Arabia's oil by American oil companies, but was forestalled by the U.S. government. For this reason, he became a target of the U.S. government, and in 1954, the FBI investigated Onassis for fraud against the U.S. government. He was charged with violating the citizenship provision of the shipping laws, which require that all ships displaying the U.S. flag be owned by U.S. citizens. 
Onassis entered a guilty plea and paid $7 million. Chapter 2 Section 4, Whaling Between 1950 and 1956, Onassis had success whaling off the west coast of South America. His first expedition made a net profit of 4.5 million US dollars. International agreements limited the number, size and dates between which whales could be taken. The Onassis factory ship and its attendant catcher ships paid little attention to these restrictions. The Norwegian Whaling Gazette made accusations based on sailors' testimonials, such as one given by Bruno Schillegeck who worked on the factory ship Olympic Challenger, pieces of fresh meat from the 124 whales we killed yesterday still remains on the deck. Among them all, just one could be considered adult. All animals that pass within the range of the harpoon are killed in cold blood. In 1954 the government of Peru claimed the Onassis fleet were whaling within 200 miles of the coast of Peru without permission and sent naval vessels to intercept them. Peruvian Air Force planes were also sent and dropped bombs that exploded near the factory ship. Most vessels in the fleet were captured by the Peruvian vessels and taken to Pata where they were interned. The venture came to an end after the business was sold to Kyokuyo Hogai Kaisha Whaling Company, one of the biggest Japanese whaling companies, for $8.5 million. Norwegian authorities suspected the involvement of Hjalmar Schacht in Onassis whaling enterprises. Schacht had previously been connected with Onassis Saudi Arabian deals. Chapter 2 Section 5, Olympic Airways In 1956, Greek airlines in general faced economic difficulties, whereby companies like Tay were affected by strikes and cash shortage. The Greek government decided to give this and other companies to the private sector, and, on 30 July 1956, Onassis signed a contract granting him the operational rights to the Greek air transport industry. When Onassis heard during the negotiations that he would not be able to use the five Olympic rings in his logo due to copyright issues, he simply decided to add a sixth ring. Operation effectively started in 1957, with one DC-4, two DC-6s and 13s DC-3s. The following year saw 244,000 passengers transported. The agreement lasted until 10 December 1974, when a number of factors led Onassis to terminate his contract. Following this event, Paul Iwanides, a high-ranking director from Olympic Airways, said the following of Onassis, deep down, did not want to relinquish Olympic Airways. He found it flattering to own an airline. It was something in which he took deep pride. It was his accomplishment. He was married to the sea, but Olympic was his mistress. We used to say that he would spend all the money he made at sea with his mistress in the sky. Onassis' time at the head of Olympic Airways is known as a golden era, due to investments he made in training and the acquisition of cutting-edge technology. For example, in 1959, he signed a deal with de Havilland to buy four Comet 4B jets. Onassis was also renowned for his attention to service quality, which led him to buy gold-plated utensils and candles for the dining service of the first-class section. During 1974, the last year of Onassis' involvement with the company, Olympic Airways transported 2.5 million passengers and had a workforce of 7,356 persons. At the time, his ownership of Olympic Airways distinguished Onassis as one of only two men in the world to own a private airline, the other being Howard Hughes of TWA. Chapter 2 Section 6, Investments Onassis was involved in the privatization of the Greek National Airline and founded the privatized Olympic Airways in 1957. Stocks accounted for one-third of his capital, held in oil companies in the USA, the Middle East, and Venezuela. He also owned additional shares that secured his control of 95 multinational businesses in five continents. He owned gold processing plants in Argentina and Uruguay and a large share in an airline in Latin America and $4 million worth of investments in Brazil. Also, he owned companies like Olympic Maritime and Olympic Tourist, a chemical company in Persia, apartments in Paris, 
London, Monte Carlo, Athens, and Acapulco, a castle in South France, the Olympic Tower, another building in Sutton Place, Olympic Airways and Air Navigation, the Island of Scorpios, the 325 feet luxury yacht Christina O, and, finally, deposit accounts and accounts in treasuries in 217 banks in the whole world. Chapter 2 Section 7, Project Omega In October 1968, amidst the Greek military junta and shortly after his marriage to Jacqueline Kennedy, Onassis announced the launch of Project Omega, a $400 million investment program that aimed to build considerable industrial infrastructure in Greece including an oil refinery and aluminium smelter. Onassis had cultivated Greek junta dictator Georgios Papadopoulos, for his assistance with the scheme, loaning Papadopoulos the use of his villa and buying dresses for his wife. The project was financially supported by the American bank First National City, and Onassis' American financial supporters eventually tired of the unfavorable terms demanded by him. The project was heavily criticized by people such as Helen Vlaikos, a journalist from Athens. Another Greek colonel, Nikolaos Makarsos, preferred a deal offered by Onassis' rival, Stavros Niakos, and the project was eventually split between them. The failure was due partly to opposition from influential people within the military junta, such as Ioannis Orlandos Rodinos, Deputy Minister of Economic Coordination, who opposed Onassis's offers in preference to Niakos. Chapter 3, Relationships and Family Chapter 3 Section 1, Athena Lavanos Onassis married Athena Mary Tina Lavanos, daughter of shipping magnate Stavros G. Lavanos and Arietta Zafrikakis, on 28 December 1946. Lavanos was 17 at the time of their marriage, Onassis was 40. Onassis and Lavanos had two children, both born in New York City, a son, Alexander, and a daughter Christina. Onassis named his legendary superyacht after his daughter. To Onassis his marriage to Athena was more than the fulfillment of his ambitions. He also felt that the marriage dealt a blow to his father-in-law and the old money Greek traditionalists who held Onassis in very low esteem. The couple had become largely separated by the mid-1950s, with the end of the marriage coming after Lavanos found Onassis in bed with a friend of hers at their home in Cap d'Antibes, the Chateau de la Croix. The house was then acquired by Onassis' brother-in-law and business rival Stavros Niakos, who bought it for his wife, Eugenia Lavanos, Athena's sister. Onassis and Lavanos divorced in June 1960 during Onassis' well-publicized affair with Maria Callas. Chapter 3 Section 2, Maria Callas Onassis and legendary opera soprano Maria Callas carried on an affair despite the fact that they were both married. They met in 1957 during a party in Venice promoted by Elsa Maxwell. After this first encounter, Onassis commented to Spyros, Skuras, they're just a natural curiosity, after all, we were the most famous Greeks alive in the world. Callas and Onassis both divorced their spouses but did not marry each other, although their relationship continued for many years. Chapter 3 Section 3, Jacqueline Bouvier Onassis Onassis was a friend of Jacqueline Kennedy, widow of U.S. President John F. Kennedy. They married on 20 October 1968 on Onassis' private Greek island, Scorpios. Onassis offered Mrs. Kennedy three million U.S. dollars to replace her Kennedy Trust Fund, which she would lose because she was remarrying. After Onassis' death, she would receive 150,000 US dollars each year for the rest of her life. The whole marital contract was discussed with Ted Kennedy. Onassis' daughter Christina made it clear that she disliked Jacqueline Onassis, and after Alexander's death, she convinced her father that Jacqueline had some kind of curse due to the assassinations of John and Robert F. Kennedy. After Onassis's death, Christina settled with Jackie Onassis for $25 million in exchange for Jackie not contesting Onassis's will dot during their marriage. The couple inhabited six residences, her 15-room apartment at 1045th Avenue in New York City, her horse farm in New Jersey, his Avenue Fock apartment in Paris, his house in Athens, on Scorpios, 
his private island in Greece, and his yacht Christina O. Chapter 4, Death and Legacy Onassis died at age 69 on 15 March 1975 at the American Hospital of Paris in neuilly sur seine France, of respiratory failure, a complication of the myasthenia gravis from which he had suffered the last years of his life. Onassis was buried on his island of Scorpios in Greece, alongside his son, Alexander. Onassis will establish a charitable foundation in memory of his son, the Alexander S. Onassis Public Benefit Foundation, which received 45% of Onassis' estate. The remainder of his estate was left to his daughter, Christina. Jacqueline Onassis also received her share of the estate, settling for a reported $10 million, which was negotiated by her brother-in-law Ted Kennedy. This amount would reportedly grow to several hundred million under the financial stewardship of her companion Morris Templesman. Christina's share has since passed to her only child Athena, at the time making Athena one of the wealthiest women in the world. Chapter 5, References and Sources References Sources, 